Respected resource persons, today's resource person, CA T. Bonsekar Garu, and uh, my dear MC members, past chairman and uh, secretary of the branch, C. N. Nirman Pal, and uh, my senior professional colleagues, and all members of the Ishavatam branch. I welcome to you for today's virtual seminar. So, yeah, you are well aware that there are so many issues in day in and day out. We are facing problems in computation of this business income because there are so many issues, especially under section 68 and 69, and 68 A, B, C, D, so many all things are there. And in addition, certain issues are there because if there is any delay in payments of this government dues, like a PF or ESI or anything, there is a possibility that the SING officer will add to the, our business account. Like that, because depreciation, if you take depreciation also, that depreciation on a certain temporary structures, instead of allowing 100%, there is a possibility of allowing 10% or excess income, excess payments of MD salary or maybe disallowed. Not only that, there are other problems are there, especially treatment of so many treatment, the dividend income, or where surplus funds are there that if you invest and if you get interest on the deposits, again, they, they will, the SING officer may add to this uh, as a business income, whether it will be treated as a business income or other income, and that we will discuss and uh, so many other issues are there day in and day out. Today, we are very fortunate that uh, at our request, see a deep bond segregator with us to discuss various issues in this, especially these cash credits. So, my dear friends, I welcome you all once again for today's uh, webinar. And before going for the discussion, and uh, I request Angor Sridhar Garu to introduce to Bonsekar Garu, because he is very well known to all people of Vishapattam, because he has uh, deliberated and he is a resource person in our Vishapattam on so many national conferences, sub-regional conferences, whatever conferences are there, he has more than so many conferences he has addressed us. So, with great love and affection on us, he has uh, he accepted our request and today he is with us. Now, I request Anwar Sridhar Garu to introduce Sri bon T. Bonsakar Garu of today's resource persons. So, attention to Sridhar Garu. Good evening, dear members. It's my pleasure to introduce C.A.T. Bonasekar, a stalwart in the direct and indirect tax, in direct taxation, international taxes practice. Since my student days, I recollect he's an excellent faculty. It's uh, really an opportunity for all of us to gain his uh, from his knowledge and experience. It's my privilege to introduce C.A. Bonasekar Garu. He's a practicing chartered accountant and practicing as partner with Messrs. CRBS and Associates LLP Chartered Accountants since 1994. He has contributed several articles on direct taxes, international taxation to several tax journals, including Consolidated Commercial Tax Digest, published by the publishers of Income Tax Reports, Taxman, Tax References, and the Income Tax Review published by the Chamber of Tax Consultants, Mumbai. He had argued in a number of landmark cases before various branches of the 
income tax appellate tribunal across the country which have resulted in establishing procedures for many common contemporary issues chief among such cases are port india limited relating to the claim of deduction for warranty expenses sacks of limited before the special bench on parity between numerator and denominator in computing deduction under section 10a port business services center private limited relating to the benefit under section 10a ssi limited relating to taxability of esops vijaya productions relating to the accrual of capital gains apollo hospital enterprises limited relating to taxability of capital gains earned in india on sale of shares of a sri lankan company eastman exports global clothing private limited relating to taxability of export incentive in the form of mlf ps scripts filtrex technologies limited relating to disallowance of under section 40a sub class 1 Latex Limited relating to application of provisions of Section 163, South India Corporation Limited relating to disallowance of interest paid on borrowed funds on account of interest free advances to group concerns, and AVM charges relating to claim of exemption under Section 11, Hillcraft Farm, Farmer India Private Limited relating to allowability of sales promotion expenditure in the form of freebies and gifts incurred by pharmaceutical industry. in the light of the cbt to circular number 5 oblique 2012 synergy maritime india limited relating to transfer pricing issues have argued in a number of cases in various benches of income tax settlement commission he has authored the following books handbook on assessment procedures under income tax act 1961 set assessment under income tax act formerly he was a visiting faculty at the icai icsi at the loyola institute of business administration on direct taxes he had delivered lectures and presented papers on direct taxes and international taxation at seminars meetings workshops and conferences arranged by the icai sirc of the icai as well as other regions of the icai apart from those organized by the professional and public bodies including several branches of various regions of the icai he is actively he has actively participated as a trustee in brain trust sessions organized by the branches of the icai he participated in training programs for commission of income tax conducted by the regional training institutes of the income tax department and also the central training institute that is the national academy for direct taxes He has been the chairman of the direct tax committee of the Hindustan Chamber of Commerce. Formerly, he is a regular columnist in the Hindu Business Line in the personal finance page featured on Sundays, authoring the column "The Tax Talk." He was a former member of the SIRC of ICA for the period 2001 to 2004. He was a past chairman of the Fiscal Laws Committee of the Southern India Regional Council of the Minister of Trade and Commerce. He was a special invitee in the direct tax committee of the ICI and in the continuing personal education committee of the ICI. He presently a co-opted member of the direct taxes and international taxes committee of the SIRC of ICI. With these few words, I am pleased to introduce our speaker today's evening. Over to speaker, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, before I start. i think i must uh, start yeah, yeah. i do the screen for you just so what i have done before i start i will let you know how i have proceeded i have identified some 30 different issues relating to business income and my audible sir yeah yeah, yeah. Yes. and also relating to additions which are made under 68 69 etc particularly in the light of demonetization where the department has been adding quite a bit of amounts which are credits purportedly made in demonetized currency which are which they call as specified bank notes so these are some of the issues that i have highlighted now i 
should admit that there are number of case laws that I may be relying on. Uh, I have one request to the chairman. Chairman, sir, I will have the material circulated with the case laws and all the other relevant uh, citations that I am referring to. I will request you to circulate this among the participants. Yes, sir. I will, I will do that right away. Just give me a minute. I will inform my office to do it. That we already sent by mail, sir. All these issues. By mail, you have sent the issues, sir. I will send it with the what I call the key. So that people don't have to take note of any of the citations, etc. So people don't have to take note of the citations, etc. Whatever I'm referring to will reach you automatically. Uh, so before I start, as I said, I've identified 30 issues. And Mr. Sridhar, you will probably share the queries. And as and when the issues, I move to the next issue, I'll request you to share it. The reason being that I am not very computer savvy. I, I have very little knowledge of operation of computers. Somebody does it. I just know how to handle the issues. So handling the uh, screen sharing, I request Mr. Sridhar to do. Just give me a yes, minute. Sir. Just give me a minute. Sir, I've already instructed my office to send the key. So that will be sent automatically. You will you'll not have to make note of any of the citations or any of the other references that I'm giving. That will be available with you shortly. Now, the first issue is on 36.5A, and you will observe that that relates to the financial year 2021, which means it relates to the assessment year 21-22. It relates to the assessment year 21-22 and talks of employees' contribution to PF and ESI of a sum of rupees 2.25 crore an odd, which is deposited beyond the due date stipulated in the relevant act rule notification or order. Now friends, earlier section 43B also provided that if the amount is not remitted within the relevant, the, the time stipulated in the relevant act rule notification or order, then there would be a disallowance under 43B of the employer contribution. 43B was subsequently amended to provide that if it is remitted within the due date for filing the return of income, it will be allowed in that previous year. Otherwise, it will be allowed in the previous year in which it is remitted was what was the amendment made in 43B. Now, several courts took a view that the amendment in section 43B has to be extended to 36.15A also. However, there were a couple of high courts namely the Kerala High Court in, and the Gujarat High Court. I'm not giving the citations for obvious reasons that I said that I will have the same circulated among the participants. The Gujarat and the Kerala High Court were against SSE. Most of the other high courts were in favor of SSE, saying that so long as the employee contribution is remitted within the due date stipulated in the relevant accrual notification or order, even if it is, sorry, even if it is beyond the due date stipulated in the relevant rule notification or order, if it is within the due date for filing return, it will be allowed. Now, the Finance Act 2021 has made an amendment to provide that with effect from 1 4 2021, the payments being employee contribution to PF, ESI, etc will be allowed only if it is paid within the due date stipulated in the relevant act to notification or order. Or in other words, the amendment in section 43B will not apply to 36.15A. This was done by insertion of explanation 2 to section 36.15A. Now the first question that arises is, what is the import of this amendment? Now, before we get to the import of this amendment, as I said, several high courts have been taking a view that it will apply even the, the amendment in 43B will apply even for 36.5A cases 
that is employee contribution to employee welfare funds. Now, based on that, many tribunals also took a view that the amendment is only prospective in nature, which means that up to assessment year 2021, employee contributions to employee welfare funds will also be allowed, even if it is paid within the due date stipulated for filing the return of income, or it will be allowed in the year in which it is actually paid. And even if it is, if it is paid after the due date stipulated in the relevant act rule notification or order. Now, the Finance Act 2021 has amended the uh, situation and has said that the amendment in 43B will not apply to 3615A. And mind you, it says with effect from 1 4 2021. Now, a question arises with effect from 1 4 2021 means does it mean assessment year 21 22 or financial year 21 22? In my understanding, it will mean assessment year 21-22, that is financial year 2021. That is financial year 2021. For this proposition, one can see the decision of the Supreme Court in a case called Sri Chaudhary Transport Corporation, where an issue arose as to what is the effect of saying that uh, uh, amendment comes with effect from first day of April 2021 means does it come into effect from the assessment year beginning 1421 or the previous year beginning 1421. The Supreme Court said in South Chaudhary Transport that it will mean that it is from the assessment year beginning 2021 that is from the assessment year beginning 142021. That is in the example that we are taking, assessment year 21-22, which means financial year 2021. So to sum up, I can say that the amendment made by the Finance Act 2021 will apply from 21-22. Prior to 21-22, in my opinion, so long as the amounts are paid within the due date stipulated in the Income Tax Act for filing return of income, the amount should be allowed as a deduction. This is my personal view. Of course, I am aware that the Hyderabad Tribunal had taken a contrary view in a single member decision. But in my personal view, again, after the amendment made, where the amendment clearly states that it is prospective in nature, it can still be argued that the amendment is only prospective in nature and applicable only from assessment year 21-22. This is my, my, my view on issue number one. Going on to issue number two, the issue is that the company has been claiming depreciation on goodwill over business. And this, has, this goodwill has arisen as a result of reorganization done in financial year 2021. Whether goodwill will be eligible for depreciation. Now we have section 3212, which has been amended by the Finance Act 2021 again, where they say goodwill will not be eligible for depreciation. Friends, you will recall that there was a decision of the Supreme Court in a case called Smith Securities, where the Supreme Court had held that goodwill is entitled to depreciation. In fact, Section 32 also elaborately deals with how the depreciation should be disallowed. So even if the goodwill belongs to a previous period, that is prior to the assessment year 21-22, still the further depreciation of that would be disallowed with effect from assessment year 21 This is how they provide for. Now the question is, will it applic be applicable only from 21-22? It will be applicable only from 21-22. Depreciation up to 2021 assessment year can be claimed by an SSE on goodwill. Now, my second part of the query also I have answered, where I have asked, what if department has disallowed depreciation in earlier years, and that matter is pending in appeal before the tribunal, the High Court or Supreme Court, what will be the effect of that, whether the 
the department can argue that depreciation should be disallowed even for those years the answer is no prior to assessment year 2122 depreciation is allowable based on the decision of supreme court in smith security from 2122 assessment year onwards based on the amendment made by the finance act 2020 finance act 2021 depreciation cannot be claimed on goodwill now the third part of the query is a very interesting query or a very important query now what is goodwill now if i take section 3212 it says no how intangible assets being no how patents trademarks licenses copyrights franchises or any other business or commercial rights of similar name now yield smith securities the supreme court had said or any other business or commercial rights of similar nature includes goodwill that is what the supreme court had held in smith securities now if one were to go on that basis then any other asset which is a business or a commercial right is eligible for depreciation but then now the amendment says goodwill is not entitled for depreciation so basically what is goodwill goodwill in in an accountant parlance is nothing but an inherent you know capacity of a business to earn profit the inherent capacity of a business to earn profit what do we mean by the capacity of a business to earn profit what do we mean by the capacity of a business to earn profit now no business by itself has the capacity to earn a profit it gets that capacity to earn based on various things like a brand like a trademark etc and in that one can see that for example one can take into account a, a case where you know you have a customer base so today if you see many of these startups particularly these app based startups what do they do they create a base and then sell the business <clears throat> they create a huge customer base and then sell the business so when we are drafting agreements instead of saying it is goodwill <coughs> it may make good sense for us to say i am selling the customer base for so much break down the goodwill into different assets which are business or commercial rights and thereafter probably it can still be urged that depreciation will be allowable on those assets which are now in the nature of various broken up assets such as as i said in the case of an example of customer list or brand which can be recorded etc this is the second issue now going on to the third issue the third issue is a case where expenditure is incurred towards woodwork on furniture laying of electrical lines etc furniture laying of electrical lines etc and this is an expenditure which has been incurred which the sc claims is revenue expenditure the department according to the department these are capital expenditure now basically apparently they are probably trying to refer to explanation 1 to section 32 to say that these are capital in nature and that only depreciation is allowable on the same now interestingly i found some very interesting decisions i found a couple of decisions of the madras high court in a case called amurtanjan finance and another case called n raghunath where the madras high court has held that the assessee is entitled to 100% depreciation on these assets being in the nature of furniture laying of electrical lines etc right in fact the chennai tribunal in a case called sps ram sites has also followed that view that has been expressed by the madras high court but then the larger question is whether it is revenue expenditure or whether it is capital expenditure in my personal view the first at the first stage itself one will have to argue or submit 
that these are revenue expenditures and not capital in nature. The reason why I say this is, these cannot create a new asset. See, invariably what the department says is, you are getting an enduring benefit. Now, enduring benefit cannot be the single or the sole test for determining the allowability. Whether it brings into existence an asset or not is the first test that has to be looked into. If it does, whether that results in an enduring benefit has to be looked into. And in my personal view, if these expenditure by way of woodwork, furniture, laying of electrical lines, particularly woodwork and laying of electrical lines, do not give rise to an asset in the first place and therefore should be allowable as an expenditure. Moving on to issue number four. Issue number four is in the light of the amendment made in section 37.1. Is in the light of the amendment made in section 37.1. Now, before I proceed, it, you will see that issue number four is with particular reference to a pharmaceutical company. Now, in the context of a pharmaceutical company, before we proceed to discuss the generality of the amendment made in section 37.1, if you will see, in respect of a pharmaceutical company, there were the guidelines of the Medical Council of India, guidelines of the Medical Council of India, where the regulations came to be amended with effect from 2015 to provide that, a 28 January 2016, I'm sorry, to provide that any benefit that is obtained by a doctor is in violation of the regulations insofar as the doctor is concerned. In other words, the doctor cannot get any benefit from a pharmaceutical company or any allied health sector industry. And that will be subject to disallowance in the hands of, or rather that is in violation of the Medical Council regulation. And the doctor is liable to be punished. Now in that, if you see, they talk of different punishments for different uh, you know, obtaining of gifts, etc. They talk of gift of 5,000 up to 10,000, removal for three months, more than 10,000 up to 50,000, removal for six months, etc. Now, in that, very interestingly, they say gift up to 1,000, uh, more than 1,000 up to 5,000 censure. Up to 1,000, there is nothing, no punishment at all. Now, again, if you see, they have not said whether this is per gift, per month, per annum, lifetime of doctor, lifetime of the pharmaceutical company, nothing. So there seems to be a vagary in that. In the light of this MCI guideline, the board, the CBDT had issued a circular saying that these should be dissolved in the hands of the pharmaceutical companies also. We have been arguing saying, that the MCA guidelines binds only the doctor and does not bind the pharma company. And in any case, the board cannot issue such a circular. And therefore, there cannot be a disallowance in the hands of the company, that is the pharmaceutical company. There cannot be a disallowance in the hands of the pharmaceutical company. But Though many tribunals were allowing it, high courts were also approving it, the Supreme Court in FX Laboratory has held that these are to be disallowed because these are in violation of the Medical Council guideline. So the first part of the query, the ASIC officer has disallowed the claim of expenditure under 37.1 for the reason that the same is prohibited by law. Is the AO correct? Clearly, the, de the decision of the apex court is staring at our face against the DSSC, and therefore the disallowance is applicable. Now the second part of the query, will it make a difference if the pharmaceutical company had gifted only desktop calendars, pen stand, tea coasters, etc., in which the name of the tablet which the company is manufacturing is printed? Now basically, if you are not in the pharmaceutical industry, 
And if you gave a gift to somebody, your dealer or whomever you gave the gift to, with your name printed, etc., then it would have been allowable as an expenditure because it acts as an advertisement. But in the light of the MCI guidelines, read with the decision of the Supreme Court in Apex Laboratories, I am afraid that even if you print the name of the tablet, if you are a pharmaceutical company, the disallowance may still operate even if the gift is of a very small value. In fact, if you see page five of the Apex Court's order, if you will see, there is a specific submission made by the additional solicitor general at paragraph 12, where he says that the idea of making the amendment in 37.1 is because expensive or extravagant gifts are being given to doctors. That is why the guidelines have come. So can one argue that these are not extravagant and therefore this relevance should not be made? In my opinion, the answer would be no, because the, the uh, point that we have to understand is that the disallowance is, is, is provided, is based on the MCI guidelines. And MCI guidelines do not talk of extravagant gifts or non-extravagant gifts. That was only a submission made by the additional solicitor general at the time of making his arguments. The next issue, sub-issue rather, is will it make a difference if the APM Pharmaceuticals is not a manufacturer, but only a distributor and has incurred the expenditure on behalf of the manufacturer. Now, if you see the MCI guidelines, the MCI guidelines say that code of conduct for doctors in their relationship with pharmaceutical and allied health sector industry. Pharmaceutical and allied health sector industry. So if one were to go on a strict interpretation, then the disallowance can be made not only if you are the manufacturer, but also if you are the distributor, because the allied health sector industry can get covered there also. The next part of the query is, can Atrium, that is the pharmaceutical company, engage the services, engage the services of a medical practitioner for consultancy and medical research? The MCI guidelines very clearly say, that if they use the services of a doctor, if a pharmaceutical company uses the service of a doctor for consultancy and medical research, it is permitted. So such expenditure paid to a medical doctor will not be subject to a disallowance. The next part of the query, can travel and hospitality be provided in the course of provision of such services by the medical practitioner? Apparently the answer is yes. This is part of rendering or, you know, uh, providing the consultancy and medical research service by the medical practitioner to the pharmaceutical company, and that cannot be subject to disallowance. An offshoot of that is whether Atrium Pharmaceuticals is required to deduct tax at source under 194R in such circumstances. Now, 194R says any person responsible for providing to a resident any benefit or perquisite, whether convertible into money or not, arising from the business or the exercise of profession. So the fundamental point is that it should give rise to a benefit or a perquisite to the person carrying on a business or profession. Now, for the purpose of doing the consultancy or medical research, if a doctor has to be picked up and dropped, that is travel facilities are provided, or if he is from a different station, air tickets are provided, etc., then in my opinion, the provisions cannot be attracted, or 194R cannot be attracted, and no TDS is required, since it cannot be called 
a benefit or perquisite that arises to the medical practitioner. Can the medical practitioner spread awareness about products manufactured by the pharmaceutical company via medical conferences, meetings, etc.? Now, I would think that even this will fall within the ambit of the MCI guideline and therefore a disallowance will operate even in respect of such payments. I will move on to the fifth issue. A company pays remuneration to its directors. A company pays remuneration to its directors as a percentage of its net profits. The remuneration is within the limits envisaged under 197 of the Companies Act. Can the assessing officer disallow the remuneration as excessive under Section 40A2? Now, Section 40A2 provides that a disallowance can be made in respect of expenditure if such expenditure is excessive or unreasonable. If an ex expenditure is excessive or unreasonable, the Disallowance can be made. The disallowance can be made by an assessing office. Now, what is excessive or unreasonable is uh, always a subjective thing. One has to look at whether these are in accordance with the market rates. Now, if I am making a purchase of goods, it is very easy to examine what is the other competitor's rates in this. But if it is rendering of service, it becomes very difficult to quantify the value of a service. You may render a service and charge a particular fee. I may render the same service, but may charge a differential fee. That depends on various factors. That depends on various factors. It is very difficult to, you know, come to a conclusion that a service among fee paid is excessive or unreasonable, is not, is not excessive or unreasonable. Now, in this background, I have seen that remuneration paid to director as a percentage of its net profits, particularly, has been disallowed by the assessing officers, saying it is excessive or unreasonable. But if you want to read the query carefully, it says the remuneration is within the limits as envisaged under 197 of the Companies Act. That means it is within the permissible limits under the Companies Act. Now, I may not be able to get an exact comparable of director remuneration. Can I argue that since it is permitted under the Companies Act, no disallowance can operate under 48 2. This is the crux of the query. The crux of the query is that the expenditure is permissible or which is within the permissible limits under the Companies Act. So the Companies Act permits such amount to be paid. So you cannot call it excessive or unreasonable. In this context, I have been able to lay my hands on a very, very old circular. Circular number 6P dated 6-7-1968. That is as old as I am. The circular is as old as I am. I was born in the same year. Just that I was probably a couple of months older than the circular. Right? So, one will see that even in 1968, the board has issued a circular saying that if an expenditure is allowable within uh, the or by some other law, that should not be disallowed that should not be disallowed under the provisions of the Income Tax Act. In fact, I'm reading, it says, I'm reading from the circular, the relevant portion. The above mentioned provision in 40A2 is not applicable in a case of a company in respect of any expenditure referred to in 40C that relates to remuneration benefits or immunities to, or to directors of companies or persons substantially interested in the company or to relatives. The provisions of 40C will continue to govern the admissibility of such expenditure. In regard to later provisions, the Deputy Prime Minister and the Ministry of Finance observed in Lok Sabha that where the scale of remuneration to the director of the company 
had been approved by the company law administration, there is no question of disallowance of any part thereof in the income tax assessment to the company on the ground that the remuneration was unreasonable or excessive. This is the circular in para 75 of circular number 6P given as early as in 1968, where the board has issued a circular that if a particular amount is allowable under the Companies Act or any other act, then that cannot be subjected to disallowance under 40A2. I just thought I will bring your attention or, you know, you know uh, refer this to you so that we can use this, you know, for the purpose of depending in case an assessing officer seeks to disallow these monies. The next issue, issue number six, is on 40A3. Now, cash payments have been made for the purpose of acquiring movie rights to screen the movies in theatres by parties, and these payments were made in cash. The recipients, that is the payees, are identifiable. The SSE has obtained confirmation letters from them. He say claims that due to business expediency, he has to pay the amounts in cash, whether the provisions of 40A3 will apply. Now, 40A3 is a very tricky provision, which says that any amount exceeding a specified amount, earlier 20,000, now 10,000, paid otherwise than by certain modes, will be disallowed in the hands of the payer. It will be disallowed in the hands of the payer. Now, the SSC in the instant case is claiming that these are out of business expedience. Now, well, let us first examine whether business expediency can be a reason for a disallowance not to operate under 40A3. Whether business expediency can be a reason for a disallowance not to operate under 40A3. Right? So you have at least two, three decisions. One, the Gujarat High Court in a case called Anupam Tele Services, the Chennai Tribunal in a case called Trident Movies, and the Chennai Tribunal in another case called Safeway Dridgy, where the Tribunal and the High Court have held that business expediency can be a reason for 40A3 exception to apply. That is, no disallowance can be made if the payment is made as a result of business experience. How did they come to the conclusion? If you read 40A3, the proviso, it says, provided that no disallowance shall be made and no payment shall be deemed to be the profits and gains of business or profession, if the aggregate, etc., 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 exceeds 10,000 rupees in such cases, and under such circumstances as may be prescribed, having regard to the nature and extent of business banking facilities available, considerations of business expediency and other relevant factors. So what the High Court and the Tribunal are saying is that if there is business expediency, even if it is not governed by Rule 6 DD, Rule 60 lists out certain circumstances and provides that in those circumstances, the disallowance will not operate. What they are now talking about, the High Court and the Tribunal are talking about, is to say that if one can demonstrate business experience, even though the expenditure is not falling within the exception specifically provided for in Rule 60D. Still, the disallowance under 40A3 will not operate according to the, these decisions. Of course, the issue in hand specifically says he is expending this money to, you know, uh, buy film, film rights for screening in the theater. So that can also be covered. Of course, there is a direct decision of the Madras High Court against SSC. That is in a case called Vadidinathan Takis. But in that case, the High Court went into the fact that the SSC was not able to demonstrate the commercial experience or the need for doing so as a result of business experience. So the High Court said, 
that it will be dissolved. But if that is a factual scenario, legally the answer is yes, but that one has to prove or demonstrate that the expenditure is to be allowed or is allowable based on business experience. I'll move on to issue number seven. Issue number seven is a case where the SSE is carrying on textile business from the year 2010 onwards. Up to year 2010, the SSE was carrying on leather business. Up to year 2010, he was carrying on leather business. Now, in assessment year 1819, there were some creditors, sundry creditors, not loan creditors, sundry creditors to the extent of some 2.14 crores, which are, according to the assessing officer, are unexplained. And he adds these because the SC could not produce the confirmation. The SC moved the I moved, moved in an appeal before the commissioner appeal. And the commissioner appeal, after examining the ledger accounts, held that these are opening balances and that section 68 cannot be invoked. But also said, since the assessing officer has not questioned the genuineness of the purchases, the addition under 68 cannot be made. Now, please note, these are not loan creditors. These are sundry creditors. So if the purchases are accepted, you cannot say the sundry creditors are bogus. Loan creditors is a different scenario altogether. Right? So the commissioner took a view that opening balances will not fall under section 68, logically. And also said, since purchases have been accepted, no disallowance under 68 is warranted. However, the commissioner went on to confirm the addition under section 41.1. Now, 41.1 provides that if there is any benefit derived by the SSE in respect of any amount which has been claimed as a loss expenditure or a trading liability, which is by way of remission or cessation of such liability, then this should be added as income. Now, in our example, you will see that the creditors are relating to two businesses. One, the textile business, which is now being carried on, and two, a leather business, which has been closed as early as in 2010. We are now dealing with the financial year 17-18, assessment year 18-19. So, in so far as the credits which are relating to the leather business is concerned, the SSE may be on a weak footing to say that he is not liable for addition under 41.1. This is particularly in the light of the decision of the Madras Tribunal, Madras High Court, in a case reported in 412 ITR 208, where the Madras High Court in similar circumstances upheld the addition. But then if one can factually show that these amounts are still under negotiation for payment or that the other party is still making a claim, then the provisions of 41.1 cannot be. But in so far as the surviving business, that is a textile business is concerned, I think the SSE is on a much better footing. The SSE is on a much better footing and no disturbance should be made in such circumstances where it is creditors are relating to a running business unless the officer can demonstrate that the credits are otherwise not payable. This is in so far as issue number seven is concerned. I will move on to issue number eight. Issue number eight deals with additional depreciation under 32.1.2a. Now, this is a very peculiar situation that I have faced. In fact, before I proceed further, I must first of all share one thing with all of you. All of the issues that I have taken are nothing from any textbook. These are only based on issues that we have handled either in appeal or by way of opinions, etc. Right? Nothing, literally nothing is based on any textbook or issues that I have found from somewhere, no. So some of these may have case law, some of these may not even have case laws. 
Now, this gain issue is a little interesting because there seems to be a dichotomy in the law. Now, you will understand that 3212A provides for additional depreciation in the year in which the asset is first put to use. In the year in which the asset is first put to use, additional depreciation is allowable on certain assets. You will also recollect that Section 43A provides that if there is an exchange rate difference and that results in a reduction or an increase in value, such reduction or increase in value has to be done in the year in which the liability is actually paid. So let us assume I buy an asset today in the previous year, 22-23. I buy it in foreign exchange, payable and deferred term. I import the machinery and payable in deferred terms. I pay for the asset only in 24-25, let us say. I am buying the asset in 22-23 and paying in 24-25. Now in 24-25, let us assume the value of the dollar goes up even more. And consequently, 43A requires me to increase the value of the or the actual cost of the asset. Well, it requires me to increase the actual cost in the financial year 24 20. Now the question is, what happens to additional depreciation? Because additional depreciation is allowable in the financial year 22 23, a suspend year 23 24. Now, for this question, there can be two views. One view is to say that you will not be entitled to the additional depreciation because you are adjusting the actual cost only in the financial year 24-25, assessment year 25-26. The other view is to say that the actual cost will always relate back to the date of the asset, the date when the asset was acquired. And therefore, additional depreciation is available. Personally, if one were to ask me, I will subscribe to the second of the view. That additional depreciation is available in such cases. But then again, practically one may have difficulties. One may have difficulties because practically the time the SSC would not have claimed the depreciation. He would have filed return of income. Now the time for filing revised return, etc., may have lapsed. What should we do in such circumstances? We may make an application under 264 to the commissioner for revision or approach the board under 119, depending on the time frame that is available to him to do the needful. This is what is my personal view. Now, next is next is part of the same query, where the SSE opts for lower rate of income tax at 22%. As per the provisions of 115BAA, Will the SSC be entitled to additional depreciation? Now, if one sees 115 BAA 2, 115 BAA 2, it says the total income of the company is to be computed without any deduction under the provisions of 10 AA or clause 2A of subsection 1 of section 32, which means that if you are opting for the lower rate of 22% as per 115BAA, then there is a specific provision prohibition in 115BAA2 from claiming the additional depreciation. That is something you may make note of. I'll move on to the next issue. Next issue is an issue where I will probably be expressing the view which may not be to the liking of many because I am personally aware that many have done this and I personally may not subscribe to the view. In fact, I am also backed by now a decision of the High Court that the view that many processes have taken is not sustainable in law. It's a very simple issue. Assessi is a partner of a firm and has received remuneration and interest from the partnership firm. The SC has treated the same as business income under 28.4. 28.5 and admitted 8% of the business income as taxable under 4480. Can he do so? Right. 
Now, 44 AD permits that in certain cases, the SSE can offer 8% or such higher sum as is business income. And no questions will be asked further in relation to the computation of his business income. This is provided for in 44 AD. And this is what one will understand in the context of 44 AD. Now, the issue is whether this is applicable. The issue is whether this is applicable even to a remuneration and interest received from a partnership firm. Now, when does 44 AD apply? It says when the sales, turnover, or gross receipts does not exceed a stipulated sum. Now, no doubt that remuneration and interest on capital received by a partner on a partnership firm is business income. But can one say that this is sales, turnover, or gross receipts? In my submission, in my personal view, it cannot be called sales, turnover, or gross receipts, though it may be taxable under the head business income. Therefore, in my view, the provisions of 44 AD cannot be applied in such cases. A similar view I will take even in the context of 44 ADA in the case of professional firms where a professional is drawing remuneration from the partnership firm. He cannot take the benefit of 44 ADA. This is my personal view. There is a decision of the Madras High Court, which is the lone decision of a high court. He reported in 430 ITR 391, it is the Madras High Court, where the Madras High Court has taken a similar view that 44 AD will not be applicable in case of remuneration and interest on capital received by a partner of a partner from a partnership firm, received by a partner from a partnership firm. Therefore, it is my view that 44 AD cannot be applied in such cases. I know a number of assessees who have taken the benefit of 44 AD, though I don't agree with such a view. Time, of course, can change the circumstances, but as of today, there is a Madras High Court against the SSE on the applicability of, applicability of 44 AD in case of partner of a partnership firm where he is applying 44 AD in respect of remuneration and interest on capital. The next issue. The next issue is that the SSE is dealing in plastic barrels, but has not maintained books of account. The turnover from the business is 1.73 crores, and the SSE has admitted 8% under 44 AD on the total turnover. The assessing officer during the course of assessment proceedings found cash credits amounting to 31.25 lakhs in the SSE's bank account and treated the same as undisclosed credit and added the same under Section 68. Further, the AO made addition towards undisclosed purchases and undervaluation of closing stock. The SC has no other business other than dealing in plastic goods. This is the first part of the query. So, the first part of the query, the officer wants to make two additions. One, an addition in respect of closing stock valuation. And two, an addition under 68 in respect of credits found in the bank's bank account of the SSC. Now, there can be a number of arguments, but I will probably like to deal with this primarily on facts. Of course, I am aware of the decision of the Bombay High Court in a case called Bhaichan Gandhi, where the Bombay High Court said that bank statement is not books of account. And consequently, Section 68 cannot be applied on bank passport. The same will apply in respect of a bank statement also. It is not books of account at all because Section 68 requires the credit should appear in the books of account of the SSC. But that apart, a larger question, you are offering income under 4480, whether the officer can make any further addition. Now, in so far as undervaluation of closing stock is concerned, I have no two views at all. Clearly, no addition can be made in respect of undervaluation of closing stock because once I have offered 8% or a higher sum, 
the business income of the SSC cannot be tampered with. But 44 AD by itself is not an amnesty provision. In the sense that if a particular amount is offered under 44 AD, it does not mean the officer cannot look into anything at all. He can look into source of investments, etc., possible. But if one can demonstrate on facts that the 31.25 lakhs is nothing but sale proceeds, because if you see the query, it very clearly says the SC has no other activity other than dealing in plastic goods. If that is so, if that is so, and if the SC can demonstrate that there is nothing else that he has, and this is nothing but sale proceeds, then no addition can be made for the simple already opted for a 44 AD, and this 31.25 lakhs is already covered in 1.73 crores, which is the turnover of the SC. Now, the second part of the query is what will happen? What will happen if the SSC is able to demonstrate that he has no business and cash credits found in the bank account or from business operations and cannot be added under Section 68? Then, as I said earlier, very clearly, no addition can be made at all in such circumstances. The next query, query number 11. SSC is running a retail trade business and has admitted tax as per provisions of 44AR. During the course of assessment proceedings, the AO found that SSC has incurred expenditure towards repairs and maintenance of his vehicle, which is used for business purposes out of undisclosed receipts. The SSC is unable to prove that the repairs and maintenance expenditure was incurred out of his business receipts. The AO therefore wants to make an addition under 69C and tax the same under 115 BBE at 60%. Can the SSC challenge the addition? I have a personal view on this, but I also have a decision on the same point. Now, the decision is a decision of the Chandigarh Tribunal, reported in 160 ITD 413, 160 ITD 413, where the Chandigarh bench of the tribunal says that if an SSC opts to offer income under 44 AF, then 69C cannot be invoked. But then if one reads it very carefully, it says that he has used the same, the maintenance of the vehicle is used for business purpose, vehicle used for business purpose, but out of undisclosed receipts. If these are undisclosed receipts, Unless the SSC can demonstrate that these are forming part of receipts from retail trade, in my personal view, 69C can be invoked. In my personal view, 69C can be invoked. I don't see any reason why one can say that 69C cannot be invoked at all. However, you will notice that there is a tribunal bench, tribunal decision in favor of the SSC. I have already circulated to the organizers the key to this, where the case laws are all given. Now, on the very same point, one other query is, he wants to tax this at 60%. I am not answering this part of the query for the time being. I will definitely answer it when I deal with a later query. This is so far as issue number 11 is concerned. Issue number 12, a bank provides a gift to a company in exchange for the company depositing its funds in the bank for a period of time. Would this transaction be covered by the provisions of 194R? Would this be covered by the provisions of 194R? Now, 194R says, any person responsible for providing to a resident any benefit or perquisite, whether convertible into money or not, arising from business or exercise of profit. Now, there is a company which has a surplus money. So, in the course of its exercising its business, it is trying to place its excess money in a bank. 
and the bank is providing a gift to the company in exchange. Whether 194R will apply in my submission or in my view, 194R will apply because if one can definitely say that it is a benefit or purpose. Okay. The next part is, would it make a difference if the gift is provided not to the company, but to an executive of the company? Now, I just read out 194R. 194R is one of the most dangerous provisions in the income tax. I just read out 194R. It says, any person responsible for providing to a resident any benefit or perquisite, whether convertible into money or not, arising from business or exercise of profession by such resident. That means the recipient of the benefit or perquisite should get it, should get this benefit or perquisite from the exercise of business or profession. So in the earlier part of the query, you will see that the company is carrying on a business or profession. And the company is getting the benefit of the project. So 194R will apply. But in the second part of the same query, you will notice that the benefit of purpose is, is derived by an executive of the company, not by the company. Now, the executive of the company cannot be said to be carrying on a business or a profit. He cannot be said to be carrying on a business or a profession. And therefore, in my view, 194R will not apply when the second part of the query is to be true. First part, yes, 194R will apply. Second part, no, 194R will not apply. This is my view on the point. Issue number 13. Surplus funds emerging out of regular business activities are invested in fixed deposits for a temporary period and interest earned out of the same. Can the interest be treated as income under the head profits and gains of business or profession? The answer in my mind is no. You have a direct decision of the Supreme Court in a case called Tuticorin Alkali Chemicals and Fertilizer, where the Supreme Court says that investment of surplus money in, in banks is to be treated as income from other sources and cannot be treated as income under the head profits and gains of business or profession. Now, the second part of the query is if the surplus funds have been advanced as loan and interest earned, can it be treated as business income? I repeat, surplus funds have been advanced as loans and interest has been earned, can it be treated as business income? Now, if money lending is an object of the business, then clearly it is a business income. The third part, fixed deposits are made as margin money or collateral for loan for the purpose of business. Will interest be treated as business income or other sources? Now, this is not a case where I am putting surplus funds in a bank FD. This is a case where I am made or forced to put the fixed deposit in a bank. I am forced to put a fixed deposit in a bank, which I am giving as margin money or collateral to the bank for a loan taken. In which case, there is a decision of the Supreme Court in a case called Karnal Cooperative Sugar Mills. Karnal Cooperative Sugar Mills, where the Supreme Court has held that it will be treated as business income in such cases. It will be treated as business income in such cases. The next issue. The next issue is that issue number 14 is that a company wishes to go for or opt for the corporate tax regime under 115BAA. The company has large amount of unutilized mat credit and plans to utilize the same after adopting the provisions of 115BAA, can the company do so is the query. Can the company do so is the query. Now, one will see that 115BAA places an embargo. If one sees 
there is no embargo in taking the max credit under 115 jb but if sorry in 115 bwa but if one goes to 115 jb subsection 5a it says the provisions of this section shall not apply to and in sub clause 2 it says a person who has exercised the option referred to in section 115 bwa so if one is opting opting for the lower rate of tax under 115 bwa that is 22% then brought forward mat credit cannot be claimed as a credit by him at all he will have to lose that so ideally if somebody has brought forward mat credit what he should do what he should do is to utilize the mat credit first and then opt for 115 bwa because 115 bwa will commence from the year in which the sc opts for the same it will commence from the year in which the sc opts for the same so ideally an ssc can first claim the mat credit by going under the regular provisions paying the 25% tax and opting for mat credit going by the 25% tax regime and once that mat credit is exhausted he can come back and claim the 22% by opting for 115 bwa the next issue an ssc claims adia on eligible undertakings which were received by the ssc under a scheme of amalgamation for the residual per period of the tax holiday can the ssc deny such claim by invoking the provisions of adia 12a can the ssc officer deny such claim by invoking the provisions of adia 12a now friends here is a, again an interesting issue now the fund fundamental point that we need to analyze is is adia deduction related to the company or related to an undertaking adia is related to an undertaking right it is related to an undertaking so if an undertaking is moved from an amalgamating company to an amalgamated company the undertaking will still be eligible for the balance years the undertaking will still be eligible for the balance years to claim the benefit of adia one may look at the decision of the madras high court in a case called renuga textile in this context there are many other decisions also which i have referred to now incidentally what assessing officers have been doing is to rely on subsection 12 and 12a particularly to deny the benefit now subsection 12a of adia says nothing contained in section 12 shall apply to an enterprise or undertaking which is transferred in a scheme of amalgamation or demerger after the 1st day of april 2007 and subsection 12 says undertaking of indian company is entitled to deduction under this section is transferred before the expiry of the period specified in the section to another indian company in a scheme of amalgamation or demerger no deduction shall be admissible under this section to the amalgamating company for the previous year in which the amalgamation or demerger takes place so what they are effectively what subsection 12 does is to say that the expenditure or the deduction under adia cannot be claimed by the amalgamating company in the year of amalgamation right in if other words it will be entirely claimed by the amalgamated company or the resulting company right this is what subsection 12 provides for 12a says 12 will not operate please note that 12 is only for the year of amalgamation or demerger right the fact that 12 does not operate does not mean that you are denied the benefit i would think you are still entitled the benefit even not withstanding the provisions of subsection 12a of section 80ia you may see various decisions which i have already circulated next is issue number 16 where the issue is that the ssc is 
building and developing housing projects and is claiming reduction of the rate IBA. And what has happened is that the SSC has violated rate IBA by allotting more than one residential unit to an individual. And the SN officer wants to deny the entire benefit of rate IBA to the SSC. Now, the question is very elementary. Should the SSC be denied the entire ATIBA benefit or should he be disallowed only the pro rata amount, which is, which is in relation to the violation? Will he be denied the entire ATIA or will he be denied only the ATIA benefit? I, sorry, IBA, uh, IBA benefit, which is in proration to the violation. So if, for example, I violated it for 2,000 square feet of built-up area, and my total built-up area is, say, 2 lakh square feet, then only 2 lakh, 2,000 divided by 2 lakh into the profits should be disallowed, or the whole of the profit should be disallowed under for the purpose of computing the disallowance, which otherwise should be allowable under ATIBA. In the context of ATIB, you have a number of decisions. The Bombay High Court in Kamal Construction, the Madras High Court in a case called uh, in a case called Arun XLO, Vishwas Promoters. There are several decisions of various courts where they have held that the SSC is to be you know, suffering only a pro rata disallowance and not the entire amount which is to be, not the entire profit which is to be subject to disallowance under, because of the violation that has been committed by allotting only one flat to more than one individual. In fact, there is a direct decision of ATIB of the Chennai Tribunal in exactly similar circumstances called Martin Bindas. Issue number 17 is related to ATWJAA. In fact, ATWJAA itself is a very peculiar provision because if one sees, it is grouped under expense or deductions in respect of certain income, but talks about deduction in respect of wages paid to employees. Wages paid to employees is not an income, it is an expenditure, but it is grouped under chapter 6A part B deductions in respect of incomes. Why that grouping, we still do not know. I have no answer to that query. But ATWJAA has been amended very substantially, has been amended very substantially. And, you know, number of changes have been made to the provisions of ATWJAA. And they have, you know, made changes in such a way that the mode of computation of the deduction is made in a particular manner. Now the query in ATWJAA, in fact, there's a typography error, there's one A left out. It says ATWJA, it should be ATWJAA. Right? ATWJAA, the query is, is it necessary that the employee has to be in a recognized provident fund in the year of appointment and the second part of the query is, is probation period is to be, to be considered for the purpose of whether the person is to be considered as an additional employee. Now, if one looks at who is to be an additional employee, it says, A, his total emoluments must not exceed 25,000 rupees per month. His total emoluments must not exceed 25,000 rupees per month. B, it says a entire contribution should not be paid to the government under the employee's pension scheme notified in accordance with the employee's provident fund. He must be employed for a minimum period of 240 days. Of course, in certain cases, reduced to 180, 150 days. And four, he must participate in a recognized provident fund. That is why the query comes. Should he participate in recognized provident fund even in the year in which he is taken into employment or only in the year in which he is now reckoned as an additional, additional employee? See, 
what happens is somebody may join in this year he may join in march and next year he will serve for 240 days so i will reckon him as an additional employee only of next year can that be done the answer is yes it can be done next year only he is entering the provident fund scheme can that be accepted yes that can be accepted now the third part of the query is or the next part of the query is can probation period be added see normally he a person will be in probation for say 6 months so i am admitting a employee in march one month he is serving this year next year he is serving 5 months on probation and then continue now can i count the period of probation also for computing the 240 days no prohibition seems to be there in ADWJAA in including the period of probation also for the purpose of computing the ADW, the, the period of employment of 240 days. There is no prohibition. The period of probation can also be included for the purpose of computing the time frame that is given under ADWJAA of 240 days. Can I just take a minute? I'll come back. Just one minute. Yes, I'm extremely sorry. Now coming to the next issue. The next issue is issue number 18, where the SSC is running three windmills. And during the previous year, 2021, the SSC admitted a total income of mill after claiming ATIA. However, the SSC was unable to upload the return of income within the due date specified under 139.1 due to technical glitches in the income tax portal. The SC was able to file the return of income only after 14 days from the due date for filing return of income. The report in form 10 CCB was also filed along with the return. That is, after the due date for filing the return of income. Will the SSC be denied the benefit under ATIA? Now, ATIA very clearly mandates that 10 CCB must be filed before the due date for filing the return of income. If that is not done, then probably one will be justified in saying that ATIA benefit can be denied. But if one looks at the facts of the present case, one can observe that the delay was not attributable to the SSC. The delay happened because there were technical glitches in the portal. So what we have done is we have taken screenshots of what happened and moved a petition under 119 to the board asking them to condone the delay. Asking them to condone the delay in filing the Form 10 CCP and consequently permit us to claim the ATIA benefit. This is what we have done in all such circumstances. Okay. We have a number of such, because you will recall. That, that period, there were a number of technical glitches and many cases returns could not be uploaded, though we wanted to upload the return. And the department has, you know, the, the, the uh, CPC has been denying the ATIA in such cases, in 143-1 proceedings. So we have now moved the uh, board under 119, asking them to you know, condone the delay in filing the form 10 CP and our CCP and allowing us the benefit of claiming the uh, reduction under ATI. The next query ABC, a domestic company, wished to opt for lower rate of tax at 22% under 115 BAA for the assessment year 2021. Remember that 2021 was the first year when 115BAA came into operation. However, ABC Private Limited was unable to file the requisite Form 10 IC, which had to be filed electronically on or before the due date for filing the return of income as per Rule 21AE of the Income Tax Rules. However, 
ABC Private Limited has filed the return of income before the due date for filing the return of income. ABC Private Limited has not filed Form 10IC to intimate exercising option of paying taxes. As per the provisions of BWA, 115 BWA, the AO denied the benefit of claim of lower rate of tax. Can the assessing officer do so? This is the first part of the query. Now, there is a circular of the board, circular number 6 of 2022, circular number 6 of 2022, where they say that for the first assessment year, that is assessment year 2021, if the requisite form 10 IC has not been filed, still the benefit of 115 BWA, that is a lower rate of tax, should not be denied to the LLC. And they have gone ahead and said the delay in filing Form 10 IC as per Rule 21 AE of the rules for the previous year relevant to assessment year 2021 is condoned in cases where the following conditions are satisfied. The return of income has been filed on or before the due date specified under 139.1. The SSE has opted for taxation under 115BAA in of the Act in E of filing status Part A General of the Return of Income in ITR 6 and 10 IC is filed electronically on or before 36, 2022 or three months from the end of the month in which the circular is issued, whichever is later. So, one can take the benefit of this circular so long as they have opted for the lower rate of tax in the return and file the 10 AC at least by 36, 2022 or within three months from the end of the month in which the circular is issued. The circular is issued on 17, 3, 2022. The three month period also ends on 36, 2022. So if it is done within that day, then one can claim the benefit of the lower rate of tax under 115 BWA, that is 22%. But very unfortunately, I find that the board circular says the return of income for assessment year 2021 has been filed on or before the due date specified in 131. Now, if one goes to 115 BWA, 115 BWA says 10 IC should be filed within the due date stipulated under 13091. It does not require the return to be filed within the time stipulated under 13091. I do not know why the board is introducing such a uh, condition saying that only if you have filed a return within that time, I will give you the benefit of I will give you the benefit of the lower rate of tax under. 115 BWH. This appears to be unfair to my mind because there is no such condition imposed in 115 BWA at all. I think somebody should subject this to a challenge. But if you have filed the return within the due date, well, you fall within the ambit of the circular and there should be no problem at all. And there should be no problem at all. I'll go on to the next issue, issue number 20. SSC is in the business of wholesale trading in ready-made garments, wholesale trading in ready-made garments, SSC normally sends goods to all parts of India, and in some cases, the purchasers, purchasers deposit the sale value in cash into the bank account of the SSC. In the previous year, 11 to assessment year 16, 17, and 17, 18, amounts of 37.48 lakhs and 45.98 lakhs respectively were deposited in the bank accounts of the SC by various purchasers. In the reassessment proceeding, assessing officer treated the entire cash deposits into the bank account of the SC as unexplained credits and levied tax at the rate of 60%. Surcharge by invoke plus surcharge by invoking the provisions of section 115 BWEC correct. Now straight away one can say that for 1617 assessment year, 115 BWE has no application at all. 115 BWE, if at all it has application, is applicable only from assessment year 1718. It has no applicability for assessment year 1617. Of course, the larger question is can 
these amounts be added for 17-18 and taxed at 60%. Now, the facts are like this. SC is in wholesale trading of ready-made built garments and purchasers deposit the sale value in cash. Now, what happened is, as a result of the demonetization that happened, there were a number of issues that came up. I will deal with all of this independently. But one aspect that has come up is the applicability of the higher tax rate that is provided for in 115 BWE. That is 60% plus a charge at 25%. Now, my personal view is that though 115 BBE says it applies from 14 2017, 115 BBE can be applied. That rate can be applied only from the date on which the bill got the assent of the president. 115 BBE came into the statute books. It cannot be applied prior to that date. I am relying on the decision of the Supreme Court in a case called Vatica Township, which was rendered in the context of 113. 113 was dealing with the levy of surcharge, was dealing with the levy of surcharge in cases where there was a surge and was introduced in the statute books and was introduced in the statute books with effect from a particular day. Now the question was whether the question was whether the, the, high, the surcharge can be applied in respect of surcharge happening prior to that day. In respect of assessments completed after that day, Supreme Court said, no, this is a substantive charge that is getting created. That can be created only from the day on which the provision was inserted and surcharge happening on or after that day. Applying the same principle, I would think that the rate of tax of 60% plus surcharge under 115 BBE can be applied only from the date on which 115 BBE came into the statute books and not for the whole of the assessment year, 17, 18, previous year, 16, 17. I'll move on to the 21st issue. 21st issue is that the assessment of an SSE was reopened for the reason that he had made cash deposits of 25 lakhs on 16 8 2017 into the bank account and that the same has escaped assessment. In the previous year, relevant to assessment year 1890, he had made cash deposits of 4 lakh on 31 12, 7 17, 25 lakhs on 16 8 17, and 3 lakh on 2 3 18, totaling 32 lakhs. In the course of reassessment proceeding, he submits that the 25 lakhs was nothing but a refund of advances given for purchase of a property out of earlier withdrawals in the bank account. Right? Now, can the assessing officer make the addition? Now, my view on facts, I'll go to the law later. On facts is that if he can demonstrate that the Amount was given as advance for purchase of property earlier out of accounted sources, there is no problem. That addition cannot be made. On facts, he may still have to prove the source for the deposit of 3 lakh at 4 lakh. He may still have to prove the source for the deposit of 2 lakh and sorry, 3 lakh and 4 lakh made into the bank account. But then legally, if he can demonstrate that the 25 lakh addition is not warranted because he has only got a refund of an amount which he has earlier given as advance for purchase of the property, which advance was given in, an, uh, in the current previous year, but it was given, uh, the agreement of sale was entered into on 25 6, 2016 means that is in the previous year, 16, 17. So it is in an earlier previous year. That cannot be subject to addition in the current year. So if he is able to demonstrate that, it only came as a refund. 
of an agreement of sale which got cancelled, then the 25 lakh addition cannot be sustained. Now, there are decisions of various courts, including the Bombay High Court in Jet Airways, the Delhi High Court, the Gujarat High Court, the Madras High Court, and all of it, which have already circulated, where they have said that if the reason for reopening fails, then the reopening itself fails. So that can be a possible defense in law. Of course, there is a Karnataka High Court against the SSC, but all other high courts are in favor of the SSC on this point. The next issue. SSC is in the business of manufacturing and trading in gold ornaments and had deposited cash into the bank of 2.5 crores after 8-11-2016. 8-11-2016 is the date of demonetization. The SSC had recorded cash sales in the books up to 7-11-2016 and had deposited the cash accumulated up to that date out of sales into bank accounts. The SSC officer did not accept the source of deposit of cash as out of sale of gold ornaments, but added the same as unexplained credit under 68. The AO has taken such a stand because there was a sudden rise in cash sales in the month of October 2016. And he has arrived at the conclusion that in order to accommodate the unexplained money, the SC has increased the sales in the month of October by rewriting the cash book. What defense can be taken by the SC? Now, before I proceed to the legal issues, the, or the facts rather, there is a Delhi tribunal where the Delhi tribunal has taken a view that if the SSC has reflected this as sales and the sales is accepted, because when I accept the sales of an SSC, I will also accept the stock reduction of the SSC. Once I accept the stock reduction, the sales stands accepted. If the sales has been accepted, then no addition can be made under Section 68. This is the view taken by the Delhi Tribunal. There are also other decisions on the very same point. There are also other decisions on the very same point. So one may have to factually demonstrate that the sale was made in those years. See, all of us are aware that once demonetization was announced, people were selling even in the uh, specified bank notes. I'll come to that when I deal with the next issue. Okay. The gold, particularly gold ornaments were sold at a premium at that period. People were trying to buy gold. Probably out of unaccounted money. Remember that at that time, there was no prohibition up to the 8th day of November in dealing in specified bank notes. Even on 8th November, time was given till 12 p.m. Only from 9th November, they become specified banknotes. From up to 8th November, they were very much acceptable as regular notes, not as specified notes. Therefore, the, the Delhi Tribunal says that if the SSC can demonstrate that there is a reduction in stock, then no further addition can be made under the provisions of 68 or 69 or whatever the provisions in the act. Incidentally, at this point, I may also point out one other decision of the Delhi Tribunal, which is interesting, not directly relating to the facts of the present case. It is in a case called Aniket Agarwal, the Delhi Tribunal, where the Delhi Tribunal is relying on a board, the board instruction. See, board instruction said up to two and a half lakh deposit of specified bank notes is permissible. Right? So the board, the, the Delhi Tribunal relying on this board circular said, if specified bank notes up to two and a half lakhs have been deposited, no addition can be made under the provisions of the act. Right? This is so far as issue number 22 goes. Issue number 23 is a case where the SSC is you know, has been accepting specified bank notes even after the demonetization date, that is after 8-11-2016. And the SSC has been paying, depositing these specified bank notes into the bank account. Now, whether the assessing officer can make a disallowance in respect of these amounts or add these amounts under section 68 is a question. 
whether he can add these amounts under section 68 is a question. Now, interestingly, just give me a minute. Interestingly, the income tax authorities have been saying that you have dealt with illegal tender. And therefore, the addition is to be made. First thing is, assuming I have dealt in illegal tender, that is punishable with the R by the RBI. The income tax department cannot make an addition thereof. The mere fact that I have accepted illegal tender may be punishable by the RBI. That cannot be a subject matter of addition under section 68 by the department. That is my first point. The second point is, if you see the demonetization that happened in 1978, there is section 4 of the High Denomination Bank Notes Demonetization Acts 1978. Please see section 4. I have reproduced it in my uh, note that I have circulated. If one were to see section 4 of that act, it says, there is a prohibition from any person from accepting or receiving such high denomination notes on or after the 16th day of January 1978. So from 16th January 78, high denomination notes which were specified, that is 1000 rupee notes in that case, became illegal tender. But if you compare that with the demonetization made in 2016, you will see that the only thing that was done was the Prime Minister came on TV at 8 p.m. and said that these should not be accepted. It did not become illegal tender. In fact, if you see, the, there is a specified banknote cessation of liabilities act 2017. That act said that if you hold specified banknotes after the 31st day of December 2016, then you are punishable. So holding such notes after 31st day of December 2016 is punishable. In other words, it never became illegal tender on 8th of November 2016. So, even the argument of the revenue that it is illegal tender is ill-founded. That cannot or that is not correct. That is not correct. And therefore, in my view, the additions cannot be made merely because somebody accepted specified bank notes between 8-11-2016 and 31-12-2016. They did not become illegal tender, A. Eh? And even if it became illegal tender, it is punishable by the RBI. It is not for the income tax authorities to make any addition, any addition therefore. Right. Issue number 24. Can cash sales made prior to 1-4-2017 exceeding to 22 lakh be held as bogus and added under section 68 if the seller has not collected the identity of the buyer. Right? Seller has not collected the identity of the buyer. Now you will recollect that there is a section 269 ST which prohibits receiving considerations in cash or in a sum exceeding rupees 2 lakh. Right? And you will also recollect that section 269 ST is applicable from 1-4-2017. It is applicable from 1-4-2017. It is not applicable. It is not applicable prior to 1-4-2017. So accepting 2 lakhs prior to 1-4-2017 cannot in bring into effect or bring or attract the provisions of 68. Even on and from 1-4-2017, it cannot attract the provisions of section 68 
at best it has to be tested on the liability for penalty for violation of 269 st right the next issue number 25 is during the course of search proceedings a loose sheet was found from the premises of the SSE in which the SSE had written certain amounts against some names. The SSE officer proposes to make an addition of the amount mentioned in the loose sheet as unexplained income under section 68. Now this part first. Credits in the books is the basic requirement for addition under section 68. Section 68 requires that the credit should be found in the books of accounts. If it is found in a loose sheet, addition under section 68 is not permissible. This is point number one. Point number two, will it make a difference if the SSE has made a statement recorded from him, made as in the statement recorded from him, stated that the amounts mentioned in the loose sheets are interest receipts from all the pawnbroking business and some of the amounts are loan received by him in pawnbroking business. Now, whatever amounts are received by him from the pawnbroking business, that is the principal repayment, that cannot be added under any provision of the Act. Unless they are, the, the, the revenue can demonstrate that the source for giving the money is not available for as a loan. Only in such circumstances, an addition can possibly be contemplated. And that will relate to the year in which the loan was given. That the department has to find out as to in which year that has to be done. The second part is, as far as the interest is concerned, yes, addition can be sustained, not under section 68, but as business income. Incidentally, you will notice that there is a board circular. This may not uh, you know, directly apply to the facts of the case, but there is a board circular which says that mere addition on the basis of sworn statements cannot be made. It has to be backed. It has to be backed by evidences. Only a sworn statement, no addition can be made, is what the board circular says. Likewise, Without any supporting addition, only on the basis of loose sheets alone, it may not be possible to make an addition for which there are various decisions which I have circulated, right? Which I have circulated. So, as far as query number 25 is concerned, no addition can be made under 68. But if the source for giving the advance towards the loan in pawnbroking business cannot be demonstrated, that can be added in the year in which the loan was given in the course of the pawn working business. Interest can be added, but not under section 68, but as business. The next issue, issue number 26. In the course of the survey, excess stock was found and the same was surrendered as additional income by the SSE. There was also some cash found during the course of the survey and SSE explained that the same was out of cash sales, which are not accounted in the books of the SSE. The assessing officer has tagged the same under section 69 and invoked the provisions of section 115 VBE to tax the same at the higher rate. Right? Now, very clearly, if excess stock is found and excess cash is found, whether the provisions of 69 are applicable or not is the question. Now, if one can demonstrate that these are out of business funds, business receipts, then no addition can be made under 68, 69, 69B, 69C, etc. If that be so, then the provisions of 115 DBE have no applicability. Remember that an addition may still be warranted. But 115 BBE may not be applicable or will not be applicable in such circumstances. This is so far as issue number 26 is concerned. Issue number 27 is a very, very tricky issue. Assessee claims set off of business loss, loss from business assets by the assessing officer under 28 
against income being unexplained cash credits assessed by the assessing officer under 68 on the ground that income assessed by the assessing officer under section 68 is income from other sources and 71 permit set off of loss from one head against income from another head is this stand correct now what has happened the facts are like this the assess as an assessment being framed on him the assessing officer is making an addition under section 68 the assess has brought forward business losses he wants to set off the brought forward business loss against the addition framed under section 68 can he do so now at first blush it appears that an addition under section 68 Does come under the head other sources, but in my personal view, Section sixty eight does not come under any head of income. Sixty eight, sixty nine, sixty nine A, sixty nine B, sixty nine C do not come under any head of income at all. Therefore, if therefore if an addition is made under Section sixty eight. that will be on a stand alone basis and set off of brought forward losses cannot be claimed against such incomes which are assessed under section 68 right and now that is statutorily provided for but even prior to that i would think that should be the position there is a gujarat high court reported in 247 itr 290 where a similar view has been taken the next time coming almost to the end of where i need to stop i have just two three more issues the assessing officer based on bank statement made additions under section 68 whether the assessing officer can make addition under 68 only based on bank statement i think i answered this before itself where i said that a bank statement cannot be treated as accounts of the books of account of the assessee section 68 specifically says credits appearing in the books of account of the assess right credits appearing in the books of account of the assess so since the credit is not appearing in the books of account of the assess but in a bank statement 68 is not invoked but then this addition can be tested in the light of section 69 one can say this is an unexplained investment but section 68 cannot be invoked there is a decision of the bombay high court in a case called bhaichand gandhi where the bombay high court has held that that cannot be treated as books of account of us likewise there is a very interesting decision of the uh, al delhi high court in mayawati's case where they say balance sheet is not books of account mayawati's case the delhi high court likewise the madras high court in taj borwell says p and l account is not books of account i am just drawing this may you know bringing your attention to these decisions the next is a very simple issue there are five family members in the case of each family member and uh, a cash deposit is 2 lakhs is made in the bank account for 2021 right the assessing officer wants to add the amount under 140 in the course of assessment as 2 lakhs of unexplained credit under section 68 now the assessee says that the deposit itself is only rupees 2 lakh which is less than the maximum amount not chargeable to tax my total income is not exceeding the maximum amount not chargeable to tax therefore no addition can be made whether this is permissible i would think that section 115 gd is to be tested on a stand alone basis even if the total income the assess does not exceed the maximum amount not chargeable to tax if there are unexplained deposits in the bank account or there are unexplained credits in the account books of the assess that can be tested and an addition can be made under section 68 and the tax rate specified in 115 bb will be applicable one cannot claim the benefit of basic exemption in such case now that brings me to the last query 
The SSE has deposited 25 lakhs in a savings bank account, which is held by him jointly along with his wife. He has deposited 25 lakhs into a SB account, which is held jointly along with his wife. The assessing officer, while completing the assessment, added 50 lakh 50 percent of the cash deposits in his hands and reopened the assessment of Mrs. Ashok to tax the balance 50 percent in her hands as income escaping assessment. Whether he can do so. Now, in this case, what is what the assessing officer is seeking to do is, since it is a joint bank account, he is seeking to take where you know 50 50 percent in the hands of each of the assessees as unexplained investment. I would think this cannot be done. The assessing officer has to find out who made the deposit and add it only in the hands of that person. He cannot simply say, "Since you are joint holders, fifty fifty percent each." No, that may not be permissible. Friends, these were just the issues. In fact, when I was contacted by the branch, I was specifically requested to handle this subject. This subject was something that I had handled just a few days back. For the Bombay Chartered Accountants Society and seven other associations, which had joined together to conduct the again a, a, a virtual conference, right? where I had shared these and discussed these issues, where of course there were huge participation, and the organizers said, if I can do this for the benefit of the members of the Vizag branch, it will be good. I thought, why not? Because for me, this gives me newer insights. Because every time is a learning. In fact, if somebody had listened to me he, during the course of my presentation in the earlier program, we would be there would be a difference between then and now also. I have made some changes and improvements because every scope for every chance for speaking is a scope for improvement. So to that extent, again, I must thank the organizers for giving this opportunity. And if anybody has queries. You may please raise the same with the permission of the organizers. I will try to answer that to the best of my ability. Thank you very much, and I will pause here for any queries that may be raised. I will hand over the proceedings back to the organizers. Thank you, sir. So, my dear members, if you are having any questions or you want any clarifications, that you can seek the clarifications from our bomb sagar guru. members please the game is not there right members please ask the whatever doubts or clarifications you can ask unmute yourself and ask bank sector garu is ready to answer your questions he has given excellent opportunity for us today in spite of his busy schedule sir please sir i am panchakshri chartered accountant regarding the sir told that the bank statement is not part and parcel of the books of accounts so why please explain Sir, my books of account are my cash book, my bank book, whatever I maintain. Mm -hmm. Bank statement is not maintained by me; it is maintained by the bank. Therefore, it is not my books of account. But the entries corresponding to the bank statements, sir. Let, let, us, let us let us see. Let us assume. Mm -hmm. Let us assume that is why I said only based on bank statement. If you have not maintained books at all. Then the bank statement cannot be a basis for making an addition under Section 68. If you have maintained books and the corresponding credits are found in your bank book, then yes, additions can be framed under Section 68 in respect of those amounts. Does that clarify, sir? Yes, sir. Members, any more questions, please? Sir, in one of the cases, the husband is carrying a business in milk products. That is, he is selling uh, milk uh, packets. Um, daily, he is depositing cash into bank in his bank account jointly held with his wife. That the assessing officer made all the deposits, cash deposits made in the bank account as in, as his income and raised a demand for 
rupees 30 lakhs. Okay. Saying that uh, 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 anti deposits are uh, his income. In both the cases, in his wife case also, the uh, cash deposited in the joint account was made assessment in both the hands. Now, obviously, now, is that, uh, yeah. obviously, nobody can make the addition in both hands. If at all there is a doubt, he should have made it substantively in the hands of one person and protectively in the hands of the other. He cannot make it substantively in the hands of both persons. That is A. Now, B is if the SSC can, you know, demonstrate that he was in fact carrying on a business in sale of milk packets because he will have purchases, he will have suppliers, he will have customers, all of that. If he can demonstrate all that, and then I think there can be no addition made in respect of deposits in the bank because the SC can show what is the profit from that business only and offer that to tax. The addition is completely unwarranted, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, members, any more questions? Or you want any clarifications? Please unmute yourself and ask, sir. This is a very great opportunity for us, for Visapatna members. Because that we can get the replace on the eminent speaker. Bansekar Garu. So. Chairman, sir, I will do one thing. I will type out my mail ID in the chat box. So if anybody has any queries later also, they can contact me. I have typed out my mail ID and sent it in the chat box. If anybody has noted, can note it down. Of course, the, I have as already said, I have already circulated the key to this also. Okay, sir. Okay. Sir, okay. sir, sir, one, one doubt, sir. Uh, regarding that uh, inter interest provision to MSME creditors, uh, as per MSME Act, uh, uh, this one, uh, if there is any delay in payment to the MSME vendors, uh, more than 45 days, uh, we have to provide the interest provision. This thing, is there any provision to escape or uh, this one exception to the rule, sir? No, sir. No, sir. Hmm? To my yes. knowledge, no, sir. This one, the interest provision is, uh, that, uh, is the same to be disallowed in income tax computation, na? Why, sir? Why interest should be we have, That is compensatory in nature. No, we have not paid, na? Interest. Interest only if it is or MSME interest. I don't know whether 43B is covering that. Just a minute, sir. We have not deducted TDS also for that. Uh, if you have not deducted TDS, then there is a problem. But uh, 43B, one minute, sir. Let me just check. Because it only talks about interest from public financial institutions, state financial corporation, state industrial corporation, loan or borrowing from NBFC, any sum payable by way of interest on loans or advance from scheduled bank, etc. It does not talk of interest payable to MSME, but if TDS provisions are attracted and if you have not deducted tax, then yes, it will not be allowed in that year. But TDS provisions are not attracted if it is a smaller amount, then it may not be. No disallowance will apply. So the better option is if you are making the TDS provision means we have to pay the interest to the party, na? Yes, sir. Hmm. Or otherwise, uh, if you are uh, taking a letter from the MSME creditors, uh, no need to pay interest or like that, uh, then we cannot, no need to provide the interest provision, sir. Sir, if you are not making an interest provision, nobody is going to raise any question from income tax. Right? That is not an income tax issue at all. 
<laughs> you are not making a provision for any expenditure or making any claim for an expenditure. No income tax income officer is going to raise a query on that. Sir. Query from income tax is going to raise only if you make a provision. Yeah, make a provision. So this will be disallowed due to only non pro uh, no TDS sir because of yes, the TDS provision only. Yes sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, Bandar Yankee Singh, sir. Tamu, you are right. Ah, ah. Sir, already question just sent me. Question from Chaperson. Okay. Sir, here is another number. Sir, here is another number. Here is. I am not changing anything. Uh, okay. Really, a wonderful deliberation, sir, because uh, your yes, sir. your yes, sir. issue yes, sir. Is in there is a opportunity for the people to see go through the issues. And ascertain the subject, and they can understand first before coming to the section because this is a very good exercise, sir. When you are given the cases in advance, people are enthusiastic to study it and come to to prepare it and come come to the conclusion. And if you are all any doubt is there, you have clearly deliberated. Really, you have given us a very wonderful opportunity, sir. So within a short time, but you have kindly consented, and we are very grateful to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Bond Secretary Garu. Now I request our uh, secretary, sir, to propose water. Thanks. Uh, a very good evening, dear members. Uh, it is my pleasant duty to present the water thanks for uh, today's session. So, on behalf of the members of the Vishakhapatnam branch and the managing committee of the Vishakhapatnam branch of SIRC of ICAI, I would like to thank the uh, speaker of today's session, C. A. C. Bhanushekar Garu from Chennai, for his uh, deliberations on these specific cases that he had shared with us. Uh, I believe that uh, those cases and the understanding and the detailed interpretation of those uh, uh, situations would certainly help us in, you know, relating them to the cases that we are handling and. And, and will help us in presenting our cases better. And uh, we are also thankful to you for sharing the citations, which may be useful to us. Uh, I would like to thank you for your detailed presentation and for, for having shared your uh, precious time and uh, delivered on these topics. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, dear members, before we conclude the session, I would like to also inform you about the upcoming seminars. On 18th of June, we are having a full day CP seminar. Uh, which is uh, going to be a physical seminar on uh, income tax in particular. The first session will be handled by uh, CAI Kamasha Srigar from Vishak Bhattam, our very well-known senior member. And he will be handling the topic of analysis of the amendments to the provision of reopening of assessments, which is a recent, uh, based on a recent Supreme Court judgment. Uh, the second session will be a session by C. Anil Bajawada uh, from Vishak Bhattam again. And uh, he will be handling the topic on basics and incentives under the customs uh, law and incentives and exemptions under the FT foreign trade policies. Uh, dear members, I would also like to inform you that we are uh, currently putting in a lot of effort to organize the CA day uh, function on 1st of July. And uh, I would really like to request all the members to participate with their families and uh, you know take part in the uh, cultural and sports events that we are organizing. Your support is very essential to make the program a success. I once again request you all to wholeheartedly participate in the celebrations and join us and uh, help the management committee. Uh, with these few words, I'd like to thank everyone for the uh, evening session. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, one thing, sir, before concluding, uh, Secretary Garu, just now one program is concluded on 17th by virtual because uh, this is... Uh, <clears throat> Audit of non corporate entities on 17th evening, sir. This is just now it is confirmed. That's why I'm telling. That is very good, sir. I think uh, there was a recent uh, technical guide issued by the Institute on all these non corporate entities. And I think it is essential that uh, going forward, 
we are going to uh, finalize the individuals and all non corporate entities by july so therefore the application of this guide i think it becomes effective from this year itself so i think it should be a very interesting this session i would request all the members also to join us for that session also thank you so much sir thank you everyone and good night namaskar